Today we have an awesome guest speaker, my sister-in-law, my, my younger brother Aaron, married a wonderful woman, young lady when I met her, Cheyenne Fonseca, and, and I just told her today, and I hope you guys are okay with this, I said, you know what, you are free to speak whatever the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart. Come on, right? Uh, we don't, uh, come on up, Cheyenne. This is my sister-in-law, Cheyenne. She is also a pastor, Pastor Cheyenne. But I get to call her sister in love, right? Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Well, it's so awesome. So awesome. So excited to be here this morning, uh, despite my, my nerves. <laughs> which happens every time, anytime uh, I minister, speaks. But, um, you know, when we were worshiping just a few minutes ago, I just really, really felt in my heart, you know, as we sang the words, we want more, we want more, we want more. And I, I thought to myself, do we want more? Do we want more? And and I do. I want more. I want more. I need more of him. But do you want more? And when God goes to give you more, is there room inside your heart, inside the secret places for him to give you more? Is there room? Because a lot of times we say, we want more, we want more. And then God comes and he goes to pour more. And he's met with the secret place filled with secret things. So do we want more? Father, I just come before you, God. And Lord, today we just surrender the secret places. We surrender the secret places and we surrender the secret things, Father. And for anywhere, Lord, that you feel that you, that you could see resistance, Lord, I pray, God, that you would go to those places and lovingly and gently minister to those places, God, because you're good. You're good. He's good. God, you're good. And it's your goodness that leads us to repentance. It's your goodness that leads us to a place where we could surrender these things that don't belong inside of our hearts. And so, Father, I pray that with our hearts open wide to you, God, that today we would, we would surrender, that we'd be brought to a place of surrender to you and God, that we would be able to just fill up on all that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First off, I just, I want to thank, I want to thank first the, the pastor of the house. Um, I, I, I don't know if I've met him. I might have met him when my husband came to minister. I don't even know uh, where he <laughs> but I want to thank him because um, it's an honor to share the pulpit that he would allow me to um, to share his pulpit. And then, of course, I want to thank my brother-in-law, my brother-in-love, um, Pastor Eric, for asking me to minister. Um, it's an incredible, incredible honor. I've been married to um, Aaron, my husband, for 14 years. 14 years. Next year will be 15 years. Um, we have three beautiful children. One I just had in October, this past October, and it, that was that was crazy. That was a wild ride. Her name is Marvel Revival Fonseca. <laughs> when I gave when we gave her the name, I didn't I didn't know um, so much was going to come with her, but um, <laughs> she's she's incredible. She has greatness all over her life, and. Um, but yeah, when I, a few days before my, or actually at my doctor's appointment at 35 weeks, they told me um, 30 minutes after my doctor's appointment, you need to get into this hospital right now. You need to get, we need to deliver this baby. You're risking, um, you're risking stillbirth. And um, she's not growing anymore. The blood is moving away from her, which that means it could be, it could be any time that, that you lose this baby, so you need to get in. So we got, they got me in in hours, and that night I had my baby girl, 35 weeks. And she was four pounds, solid four pounds, 
And, but man, she's a fighter, and she fought hard, and she's here, and she's healthy and growing, and she's so beautiful, and she looks like her sister. <laughs> I love her. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've been blessed with an incredible family, um, and an incredible family in the Fonsecas. I'm just so humbled that I get to be a part of their family. But um, So I'm a mom. I'm a mommy. But... First and foremost, I am a, a daughter of God. I'm a daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so, like I said, it's an incredible honor to be here today, uh, and one of which I'll never take lightly, because I know what's on the line. I know, and I'd be a fool to act like I don't know that you probably carried in some things today, this morning, that you shouldn't even be carrying I'd be a fool to act like you, you're probably, act like you're not probably holding on to some things this morning that you shouldn't be holding on to. You probably have some things that God desires you to be free of today. There's marriages that are on the line this morning relationships with your children that are on the line. Maybe you're fighting a battle that no one else knows about. You've got some secrets locked away in your heart that keep the Lord at, you keep the Lord at an arm's distance and you say, no, that's okay, right there, Lord. You're battling depression that keeps taking you deeper and deeper. I know what's on the line. It was a little over 10 years ago my baby brother, he walked into a church youth service. He was struggling with alcohol addiction. He was struggling with drug addiction, depression. He needed healing from the heavy abuse that he was enduring at home. He needed a word from God. He needed a touch from God. He walked into the a youth church service needing to encounter God. And do you know what they were doing? They had... The entirety of the service, they had a burping contest. Now you laugh, but my brother, he was depressed. He was on the edge of giving, just taking his own life. He was deep in drug addiction, deep in alcohol abuse. And he walked in and they're having a burping contest. It was, it was so heartbreaking, and I don't, I don't know what happened to the, what the pastor at that time, and it doesn't matter what happened to the pastor at that time, that me and my husband, we weren't the leaders over the ministry at that moment, but I, I went real fast to my brother to do a type of like a damage control, I guess, but before I could say a word, my brother looked up at me, just so heartbroken, and, but also disgusted, and he said, you know what, I will never I'll never come back. I came and this is what you did with my time. I'll never come back. So when I tell you I know what's on the line, I know, what, I know there's some things on the line today. I know that you came in and maybe you look prim and proper and maybe you look like you have it all together, but I know that there's some secret things in our hearts that we're holding on to that you brought in, that you came with, that you were not, you're not meant to be holding on to. You're not meant to be carrying and that if we would just surrender these things to God, there will be a deeper level of freedom, a deeper level of encounter with the Lord. So I know what's on the line today. I know that this is a powerful body of believers. The people of God are discovering their, your gifts. You're discovering your gifts in God and learning how to move in the power of God I know there are a lot of you all who look like you have it all together. God did not bring me to minister to share my testimony to a perfect people or a clean people. My story is dirty. But it's made my victory in God all the more sweeter. God sent me to share his heart with the people who are willing to posture themselves in a place of surrender to the Lord and allow him into the secret places to discover a deeper level of healing and an even more complete fullness in which you can move in the power of God. 
people's lives are on the line today. I want to share a short story before I, before I get in. I wasn't able to print it. I did print it, but then I left it at home. <laughs> so that's, a, that's pretty far. <laughs> so um, let me share this story with you. But I have it on my phone. I do not like using my phone, but I have it on my phone. Once there was a very wealthy young man. He lived in a great elaborate house with dozens of rooms. Each room was more amazing and more beautiful than the one before it. One day he decided to to invite the Lord to come and stay with him. When the Lord arrived, this young man offered him the very best room in the house. The room was upstairs and at the end of the hall, uh, and he said, this room is yours, Jesus. Stay as long as you like and you can do whatever you want to in this room. It's all yours. Thank you, the Lord replied. And with that, the man shut the door and went about his daily business. That evening, after he had retired for, the next, for that night, there had come a loud knocking at the front door. The young man pulled on his robe and made his way downstairs. When he opened the door, he found that the devil had sent three of his demons to attack the man. He quickly tried to close the, bo- the door, but one of the demons kept sticking his foot in. Sometime later, after a great struggle, he managed to slam the door shut and return to his room, totally exhausted. Can you believe that, the man thought? Jesus is upstairs in my very best room sleeping while I'm down here battling demons? Oh, well, maybe he just didn't hear. He slept fitfully that night. The next day, things went along as normal, and being as tired as he was, the young man retired early that evening. Along about midnight, there came such a terrible ruckus at the front door that the young man was sure that whatever it was would tear the door down. He stumbled down the stairs once again, opened the door to find that there was dozens of demons now trying to get into his beautiful home. For more than three hours, he fought and struggled against the demons and finally overpowered them enough to shut the door against their attack. All energy seemed to fail him. I really don't understand this at all. Why won't the Lord come to rescue? Why does he allow me to fight all by myself? I feel so alone, troubled. He found his way to the sofa and fell exhausted into a restless sleep. The next morning, he decided to inquire of the Lord about the happenings of the last two evenings. Quietly, he made his way to the elegant bedroom and when, where he had left Jesus. Jesus, he called as he tapped at the door. Lord, I don't understand what is happening. For the last two nights, I've had to fight demons away from my door while you laid up here sleeping. Don't you care about me? Did I not give you the very best room and house? He could see the tears building in Jesus' eyes, but continued on. I just don't understand. I really thought that once I invited you in to live with me, that you would take care of me, and and I gave you the best room in my house and everything. What more can I do? My precious child, Jesus spoke so softly, I do love you and care for you. I protect all that you have released into my care. But when you invited me to come here and stay, you brought me to this lovely room and you shut the door to the rest of your house. I'm Lord of this room, but I am not master of this house. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Take all my house. It's yours. I'm so sorry that I never offered you all to begin with. I want you to have control of everything. Jesus smiled and told him that he had already forgiven him and that he would take care of things from now on. That night, as the young man prepared for bed, he thought to himself, I wonder if those demons will return. I'm so tired of fighting them each night. But he knew that Jesus said he would take care of things from now on. At about midnight, the banging on the door was frightening. The young man slipped out of his room in time to see Jesus already down the stairs. He watched in awe as Jesus swung open the door. No need to be afraid. Satan stood at the door this time, demanding to be let in. 
What do you want, Satan? The Lord asked. The devil bowed low in the presence of the Lord. So sorry, I seem to have gotten the wrong address. And with that, he and the demons all ran away. Is he Lord? Is he master of our lives? He's Lord of our hearts. He's Lord over the things that we give, but is he master over in our entire lives? First, let us go. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm going to read this portion of scripture out of the Passion Translation. 1 Corinthians 13. If I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with the profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possess unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that I could move mountains but have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievement nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own in honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place a shelter, of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. It extends beyond the gift of prophecy, which eventually fades away. It is more enduring than tongues, which will one day fall silent. Love remains long after words of knowledge are forgotten. Our present knowledge and our prophecies are but partial, but when love's perfection arrives, the partial will fade away. When I was a child, I spoke about childish matters, but for I saw things like a child and reasoned like a child. But the day came when I matured and I set aside my childish ways. For now we see but a faint reflection of riddles and mysteries as though reflected in a mirror. But one day we will see face to face. My understanding is complete now, but one day I will understand everything just as everything about me has been fully understood. Until then, there are three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. Yet love surpasses them all. So above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run Love, love is the heart of the matter. Love. God cares about the condition of your heart. God cares a lot more about what's in your heart than what's in your hands. What does that mean? God cares more about your healing than you rushing off to use the gift of healing. Now, don't get it wrong. It's a powerful thing when people of God begin to move in the gifts of God, but hear the heart of Christ. If you think for one moment that God looks past the pain, that God looks past the lack of love, the unforgiveness, the betrayal, the heart issues, if you think for one moment that God looks past that, because he's more focused on using you than loving and healing you, then you've been deceived. Then you've missed it. If God is not Lord of the things over in our hearts, if we refuse to surrender the things of our past, our hurts, our offenses, our betrayals, then you and I run the risk of ministering of delivering prophetic words, of delivering words of knowledge, moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit through dirty filters. 
When we operate in spiritual gifts with dirty things in our hearts, it dirties, it dirties the filters through which we move in. Okay? What do I mean? So what happens is maybe you get a word from God, but it comes through a heart with a dirty filter of unforgiveness. What happens is that word is then released, but it's contaminated. With, and it's contaminated with unforgiveness. And it often come out as anger or frustration, division. Or maybe you get a word and it comes through a dirty filter of insecurity. That taints the word. That insecurity taints the word given. And it often will come out in pride or with arrogance. In order to deliver the love of the Father to the heart of his children, we must be willing to surrender the things that are in our hearts. Well, I, I've done that. Some of you might. I've done that. I do that. Awesome. Now we must be intentional about keeping our hearts in a posture of surrender to the Lord. Many of us allow God into only certain areas of our lives, but refuse to let God into the secret places. And know this, Christ wants to deal with our hearts before he sends us out to a people to minister to their hearts. Let, let me say that one more time. God wants to deal with our hearts before he sends us out to minister to people's hearts. Because if you're carrying all this, all this dirt, all this grime, then that's going to taint the things. That's going to taint the heart that you're trying to deliver. Now you're trying, and the, I understand your motive, the motive it, you're wanting to do good, you're want, wanting to, to speak the heart of Christ, but it's going to dirty what God's trying to say to his child, what he's trying to deliver to his child. So it's important that we remain surrendered and that we are willing to surrender the things in our hearts. When God steps into our hearts, everything changes. Everything changes. God steps in when an invitation presents itself because, listen, he's a gentleman, with the bride. He's a gentleman. He won't break doors down. He's not going to tear the doors off the hinges. He's a gentleman and he's going to knock. God stepped into my life 21 years ago. 21 years ago. <laughs> the incredible thing is where he found me. I was broken, drunk on my bathroom floor broken from what the world had done to me, destroyed into pieces, and God met me on my bathroom floor, broken, a mess. God was not afraid to get into my dirty. He wasn't afraid of my, of my dirty. He met me there. I called out to him. I cried out for him. I said, God, if you're real... I need you to save me. I had gone to church every so often. My parents were forcing me. They were, I mean, ironic enough, my parents, they were not going to church. They were not living a life of church. But man, I was, so, I was, doing, I was going down such a dark path. I was li living such a dark life. They were like, we need to get her into church. So <laughs> here I am, but here I am. I'm broken on my bathroom floor, and I cried out, God, I need you. If you're real, I need you to save me. And in that moment, I kid you not, I felt his warmth, and I felt his love wrap around me. I stopped crying because it kind of freaked me out. <laughs> I stopped crying. And I knew in that moment that God was stepping into my life. And from that moment on, everything's changed. Nothing's ever been the same. 
Invitation is the key. Because it's when we invite God to step into our hearts, everything changes. I was on the fast track to hell until I invited him in. And even after that, the bad things I had yet to be healed of still remained until I invited him in. When we invite God into the things in our lives, everything changes. When we invite God into our secret sin, when we invite God into past abuses, past hurts, past disappointments, betrayals, when we invite God into those life-altering, life-defining moments that were broken or distorted, everything changes. It reminds me of a time I, I sat in a prophetic class um, years ago with Pastor Ricky Ramos. He was the one that was leading the class, and he was talking about how he believed that in the room that there were people that were very um, creative, but that things had happened to them, that they had had moments where uh, something changed that cre- that not change the creativity, but just stop them from being creative anymore. And in that moment, I had like a, like a daydream, I guess, in my, in my eyes of how I see it. And I saw myself, and I was sitting in the car, and I was kind of, I was humming, like, like kids do. <laughs> and I was a little girl, and my parents were in the front, and I could feel, I could feel the air was very tense. It was very, it was very, I knew something bad was going to happen. So um, I, I just kept humming, kind of trying to run away into my own world, you know. And I think my humming, well, my humming started to irritate my stepdad. And it, it built up to such a point to where he just, like, turned off the radio. And he looked back, and he just started screaming at me cussing at me. I mean, I'm like six or seven years old, cursing at me, telling me to shut up and stop. Just knock it off. I don't want to hear you. And in that moment, I, well, I asked God, why are you showing me this? I don't want to see this. I, I don't want to see it. I, I've, I know what I've been through. I don't want to see it. And God said, yeah, but that, you were a little girl. You were just a little girl, and you were just you're just being silly. And he said, that was a moment. You'd lost your innocence, you know, but that was a moment where you really had to stop being a little girl. You couldn't be a little girl anymore. You, you were scared at that moment on. You were too scared to be innocent anymore, to, to be just, to just be you knew at that moment you would have to live a life of walking on eggshells, be afraid, be, be fearful. And so God, God just told me he, he wanted to heal that in me because he, he, he wanted to bring me back to uh, innocence. And so as I sat in the room, I just cried and cried and cried. And God just, I just felt God restoring that innocence in me and just telling me, go ahead, go ahead, hum. Go ahead. You don't have to be afraid anymore. And it's something silly, right? Humming. And that's why I started humming. <laughs> it was like breaking things off of me. <laughs> and so, um, and then like maybe a few weeks later, I caught myself humming. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Okay. And then um, I remember my, my kid, my son, I was driving one day and I, I heard him humming. And he's just in the back, just like a happy little, he's a happy, the happiest little guy ever. <laughs> he bounces when he, like, yeah. walks. <laughs> he's just so happy. He's just humming. I've heard my daughter, she just hum. She'll just hum away. Just, and I tell him, I tell him, hum away. Hum away, kids, hum away. I just, I love to hear it because they're living, they're living a life. I, me and God have battled some things to get to the freedom that I live in. And it, my kids won't know that. They'll, they're, they're walking in the freedom. They're walking in a life filled with just peace and joy and love because of the things that me and God have battled together. They, they won't know. They, they don't even know. <laughs> and they won't have to. 
I think some of us have had some life-altering moments when we were younger. Someone spoke to us in ways that changed negatively the way we see or think about ourselves or got absorbed into the core of who you are and now your response is, it's just who I am. It's just who I am. You got this constant chip on your shoulder, it's just who I am. That's not who you are. That's not who God created you to be. Somewhere along the line, someone did something, someone spoke something over you, and it it gave you that. It, It got absorbed into the core of who you were, of who God created you to be. That's not who you are. Maybe you forgot about it until now, or maybe you'll maybe as I'm speaking, you're starting, you're having memories come back to mind like oh wow, I never, I never realized that this happened and this changed this in me. Understand this, it may have seemed trivial or, or insignificant or maybe you told yourself it was to ease the pain of it, but God does not overlook one thing about you and if it affected you enough to alter you in such a way that it changed how you talk to people, how you love people, how you perceive things, Or maybe you have a memory come up today and you really don't know how it affected you. Just surrender it to the Lord. And know that God wants to heal it today. And invite God into those places. As uncomfortable as it may be, invite him into those places. Now if you can, turn with me to uh, John chapter 11. John, John chapter 11. I'm going to uh, read verse 1 through 4. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant, fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her, her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters went to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The sisters, Mary and Martha, sent to Jesus. They informed him. They brought him in to their situation, and it was sickly. Now it's my belief that Lazarus had to be scary sick to alert Jesus. They're, they were like, he, I think they knew he wasn't going to make it at that point. To call to him, to bring him into the situation. Now let's go to 11 uh, through 14. It says, these things he said, and after that he said to, to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Recognize this. Jesus acknowledges death as as something only sleeping. Those things that you may feel that are on the verge of dying, those things that you feel that may have died inside, that hope you had, that dream that you had, they aren't dead. They're just sleeping. They're just sleeping. Now, let's go to verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary, um, around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now I'm going to jump down to verse 30. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and coming 
and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She's going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in, his sp in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Understand this. Everything, everything, everything that runs contrary to who God is, and what God says, when, it, when invited into that place, in this circumstance it was death. death. Death was present. But because death runs contrary to who God is, death cannot stay. 1 John 5, 11 through 12 says, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. When we invite God into death, death has to turn around. Because life, whoever has the Son has life. Life had been brought into the situation. Death had to leave. Come and see, they say in verse 34. Come and see. God was invited. That was his invitation. Come and see. Look at God's response to this invitation in their, in their dead circumstance. This is a, a circumstance. It's, he's dead. Death is heartbreaking. Death is dirty. It involves bodily fluids leaving the body. Death has a stench. They invited God into their death. They invited God into their dirty they, this was a secret place for them. This was private. They invited him in, and God's response to, the, to them doing that is he weeps with them. He weeps with them. He doesn't look down on them from his throne, disgusted. He, God doesn't get angry. How dare you bring me into this unclean situation? He weeps with them. When I was in Master's Commission, I, came, I was in Master's Commission. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Master's Commission. But I was in Master's Commission. And um, I was going through a lot of healing in my life, a lot of restoration. And I had a vision. And in this vision, I was laying down. And darkness was coming into the room and it was overtaking everything in the room and it was getting ready to overtake me and I, I just all of a sudden I saw this bright bright light beside me so of course I looked to beside me and it was Jesus well, as I would perceive Jesus it was Jesus and I just locked eyes with him and he held my hand and he said it's okay, I, I'm here with you. I feel everything you feel. And every time I, I, I winced in pain, every time I felt pain, I saw that he felt it too. And he, he started to cry. As I cried, he started to cry. And he said, it's okay, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm going to hold you through this. I'm here with you. There's not one moment I haven't been there with you. And I'm going to use this for my glory this is going to be used for my glory. And so at that, that moment, that vision just brought so much comfort to my heart, so much revelation to my heart that God wept with me. He weeps with us. He doesn't look down upon us from his, high, from his throne and thinks, disgusting. Their death is disgusting. The things that are in their life are disgusting to me. They, they're disgusting to me. He doesn't look at us like that. He weeps with us. He weeps with us in, in our pains, in our hurts, in our betrayals. He weeps with us. When they invited God into this dirty, messy, dead situation, his response was he wept. And that's his response still. 
when you and I invite him into our death, into our mess, into our stinking, our gross, our perverted, our distorted, broken situations, he weeps with us. We might have been taught by a culture we are surrounded with or even just taught by passed down incorrect theology that we need to be clean, that we can only approach God with things that are deemed not that bad, that it's shameful for us to bring those things that are, are not clean to him. But no, he, he weeps with us. Let's look at verse 38. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time... There is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out and bound, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with the cloth. Jesus said to him, to them, loose him and let him go. Lord, by this time, there's a stench. That addiction has a stench. That unhealed hate has a stench. That unforgiveness has a stench. That Those gross memories have a stench. You fill in the blank. You know what you're hiding. You know what you're holding on to. They have a stench. God says if you and I would believe, we will see the glory of God. That word believe in verse 40 in the Greek means to have faith in and to entrust with. To have faith in and to entrust with. Let me ask you two questions. Do you have faith in God to be able to handle what you're bringing him into? Do you have faith that he's able to handle what, you, what he's wanting from you? And can you entrust him with those things we need to surrender? Can you? Or when he, as he gets closer, do you curl up and bring it back towards you and turn away? Understand this, God isn't afraid of death or even things that stink of death. He's not afraid of dying hope, fading faith, that marriage that's barely holding on, that relationship that is so far gone, that son or daughter that's falling, those awful things that were spoken of. God's not afraid of our death. Those wicked and horrible things that were done to us, that shame and that defeat, you and I know what death looks like to us. If you could just say today, unashamed, unafraid, come and see, Lord. It's not pretty. It makes me sick to look at it, but come and see, Lord. I invite you, come and look at this, Lord. I'm done hiding it. I'm tired of hiding it. I'm done mourning it. I'm done burying it. Come and look. We're inviting you into this dead situation. We're inviting you into this secret place to set us free. Come and look. It was running your life until it ran into him. And now it has to leave.
because he's life. If you'd invite Jesus into it today. Jesus isn't afraid to get into the dirty and the stinking situation. We can trust that when we invite God into a situation that's as dead as dead can get, four days passed in Lazarus' situation, the stone rolled over the grave of this circumstance. They closed up shop. It was a done deal to them. But what's a done deal to us is not a done deal to God. God says, I'm not finished yet. And that's a word for someone today. I know that I know that I know that what's done to us isn't done to God. He's not done yet. You might feel like you are too far gone. You might feel like it's too far gone. It isn't because it's, it's not a done deal and God is not done yet. When we invite God to step in, he gives us the victory over everything we give him. When we invite God to step in, he gives us the victory over everything we give him. But if you and I keep things entombed in their graves and refuse to let God in, how can God... Give us the victory over things that we don't want victory over. Let me say that one more time. How can God give us the victory over things that we don't want victory over? He gives us the victory over everything we give him. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 58 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, or 1 John 5, verse 4 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is, this is where things really start to transform. But if we stay only giving God the surface things, our transformation will stay superficial. So if we stay in relationship with God, but we continue to only give him the surface things, then our transformation will stay superficial. What do I mean? God, help me with my potty mouth. Help me with my money, because those are things that are easier to bring to God. But no mention of, Lord, help me with my porn addiction. I'm watching things I shouldn't be watching at night. I'm drinking things I shouldn't be drinking. I'm smoking things that I shouldn't be smoking when no one else is around. I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing. That's when we start to go a little deeper, giving him things that are no longer superficial. Now we're giving him things that are secret in the secret place. We got to be going deeper. And maybe it's not to that extreme, but maybe you have a hate for someone that goes so deep, and every time God tries to bring it to you, you kind of write it off as it's not that bad. There's, there's sin that's worse. All the while, that unforgiveness is just poisoning every area of your heart, every room in your heart. Ephesians 3, uh, verse 17 through 21 says, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, through, though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be, be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. 
Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish in infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in, in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. We got to be going deeper. You want deeper revelation of the love of God, then you need to be willing to give God deeper things in the heart. You want more freedom in Christ, then you got to be willing to surrender those things. you got to be willing to surrender that death that we're holding on to in our hearts. I'm not telling you from some high horse. I'm telling you as someone who's had to let God into some real dirty and dead areas of my life. You see, I wasn't raised in church. My husband has an incredible testimony of being raised in church and having a mother and father who loved each other, a family who loved each other. I wasn't raised in church. I came from the opposite side of the spectrum, that spectrum. My parents were drug addicted, alcohol addicted. I was actually born a drug baby. Parents were drug addicted, alcohol addicted, and while little girls were playing with Barbie dolls and Barbie cars, I was carrying the weight of the world in a darkness that some of you cannot even begin to comprehend. Because at the age of five years old, that's as far back as I can remember, I was being sexually abused by my grandmother's husband. He told me that if I ever told he would hurt my family and kill my family. So here I am, little girl, five years old, carrying the entire weight of the world to protect my family. Now, would he have done it? No, I don't think so. Probably not. But I was five. So in my mind, he would have. He was going to. So I took it upon myself to I was going to protect my family. I carried the weight of the entire world alone. By the age eight or nine, by, by eight or nine is about the time when I just couldn't carry it any longer. He was he'd been doing it for so long, and I was so tired. You almost get to a point of where you're so tired of that you would just rather it all be ended. So if he was gonna, it was like, well then do it because I can't carry it anymore. And I told, I told my aunt. I remember it was just, uh, at that point it was just chaos for a while. Police came, police interviewed, they asked me questions. Nothing ever happened because there wasn't enough evidence. So he walked, he walks. I carried that around. Around the age of 10, my aunt's husband, because you see that man walked, around the age of 10, my aunt's husband began to sexually abuse me. So from about the age of 10 to about 13, he also um, did that to me until I stopped going over to my auntie's to spend the night, which if you, if you know anything about me, my auntie was my safe place. She was my safe place. She was like my mom. Because my mom was so into drugs and, um, and drug addicted. My auntie was my safe place. She protected me. And so when he started doing that, I lost my, safe, my only safe place that I'd ever known. I had my dad left long, long time ago. He, when I was about four years old, my dad walked out of the picture. And at home, it wasn't much better. There was a lot of physical and verbal and mental abuse. My mom and stepdad were drug and alcohol to my stepdad screaming and throwing my mom around and glass breaking and police knocking. Oh, yeah, I had some death to surrender to the Lord. So when I tell you it's okay to let God into those secret places, 
into that death, into your darkness, into those things that make you and I not that great of a person. It's because I have. And it's because I still do. The Bible says in Revelation 3.20, the church, to the church, we are the church. So Revelation 3.20, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. These aren't the words of a God who is angry or disgusted with us. When we invite him into our dirty humanity, he says, invite me in, open the door, and I'll come in. Martha and Mary invited Jesus into their dead, this dead situation. Literally, their brother was dead. In verse 41, so they rolled the stone away. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so they, may, they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hand and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. He redeemed that which was dead. He set Lazarus free from death. And he sets us free still. Still. And maybe you've been set free, but man, there's more and more and more and more. We want more. We want more. We want more. I want more freedom. I want another level of freedom. I want to go deeper in his freedom. And he sets us free still. Those grave clothes that you and I wear when we refuse to let God into the things in our life, those grave clothes will bind our hands and our feet they will keep us from moving and keep us from moving fully and effectively in the power of God. They'll keep us from reaching out and seeing the truth because the grave clothes were wrapped around his head and wrapped around his hands and his feet. Take those off. Take those grave clothes off. You weren't meant to be wearing them. Get rid of them. There's freedom. You and I were meant to be free. Galatians 5.1 says this, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again into slavery to the law. Psalm 118.5 says, Out of my distress I called to the Lord, and the Lord answered and set me free. And as I come to a close today, I just want us to, I want us to understand that we're meant to be free. Free. From everything. The great, the big, the traumatizing things. And free in the, the things that you and I would consider insignificant or minimal or trivial. We're meant to be free. So God, he stands at the door knocking. Do you hear him today? He's knocking. I have to stay at, I have to stay on the porch. You're not ready to let me in yet. Oh, okay. Maybe soon. I see you have some things you're holding on to. I can take those off your hands if you let me. Not yet. Okay. But I'll be right here when you're ready. I, 
I see you. I see you watching those things at night. I see you doing those things to yourself that you shouldn't be doing to, to yourself. I, I can help. I can help you let it go. Not yet. Okay. But I love you. I see you trying to balance the weight of the world. You're not meant to carry that. I see you feel alone. You're not. I'm here. I'll be here still when you're ready. Some of us say, no, no, I got this. I got this. I'll take care of it. I got this. Well, I don't got this. I don't got this, but I got him and he's got me and he's got this. And you know what? He's got you today. He's got you right now, right here in this moment. He's got you and he's got whatever you have. He can handle whatever you have. Whatever you have to bring him into, he can handle it. You know who can't? Us. That's why we're doing the things that we're doing to ourselves. That's why we're beating ourselves down. That's why we're tearing ourselves down. That's why we, we can't get up to the altar. We, can't, we don't feel like we can approach the throne boldly. We can't. We don't got this. But we've got him. today the call you know God's so sweet and just the beginning during worship I could just I could sense his sweet presence because you know what the things of the heart are so he knows how much they matter to us he's gentle and he's good and he's kind he knows how hard it is to surrender things that you've held on to that have become a part of who you are and to let those things go. He knows how hard that is. But I felt the sweetness and the presence, his good, good presence as worship was going even before when I stepped foot in this place. I felt it. I sensed his sweetness. I, swent, I sensed his goodness. And so you know what? You, you don't need to be afraid if if you want to stay the same then stay in your seats but if you would say you know what there are some things that are keeping me from from him there are some things that I've held on to that I know that have kept me from just being able to experience him in a deeper level and in just a in more incredible way If you would say that, then I want to encourage you to come up here, to take a stand, to be bold, and to go after God and just seeking more freedom, a deeper level of freedom. Then come up here, and I want to, I want to pray with you. But like I said, if, if you want to just continue on the path, continue just kind of being the same and living that same way and not and just letting things kind of be in your life, then just, then just stay where you're seating. But man, God is so good and he's so gentle and sweet. And if you do have something that you um, want to surrender today, you don't have to be afraid to surrender that. And you don't have to look to your left or to your right because you know what? Even though people might not come up or maybe no one comes up besides you, that does not mean that there's people that do not need to surrender today. And so, um, yeah, I just, I want to encourage if you feel like, you know what, there's some things I want to let go, then, then be brave and yes.